Okay, first and see if you got some. I don't know, see if you got some volume. Tom said, turn it up. Right. So, you're in. see that paper. Mm -hmm. Turn to Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4. Appreciate the singing. Appreciate the testifying. Love it. Colossians 4.14 4, Luke the beloved physician and Demas greet you. In Romans chapter 16 Paul closes that chapter by speaking of his fellow laborers. He commends them and he wants to mention them. In that chapter in particular, there are 35 names that he specifically mentions. Co-workers, those who labored in the gospel with him. Well, at the close of the Colossian letter, he does the same thing. Uh, he mentions particular people. Uh, look at verse 11 midway the verse. These only are my fellow workers under the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort unto me. And he speaks of Epaphras. Uh, and then he goes on down through there. And Luke, the beloved physician. Luke is in the list of Paul's fellow laborers in the gospel. Luke. So I want to ask the question tonight. Will you and I be a Luke? Okay. Will we be a Luke? You do know that God designed 
for us to work in gospel ministry. He saved you, not to sit, but to serve in gospel ministry. And he designed that we work with other believers. And that's what we have here. We have Paul and Luke working together. And these others, Epaphras and other workers who are involved. And God designed for us to be co-laborers in gospel ministry. And Luke is Paul's co-laborer and he's chief among them. He's absolutely vital in the life of Paul. Let's look at a few truths, three simple truths about Luke tonight, okay? We could look at more and be exhaustive, but I want us to think about just some simple thoughts. His name is only mentioned three times in the Bible. Three times. Yet he wrote two of the largest books in the New Testament. Luke, 24 chapters. The book of Acts, 28 chapters. And yet only three times do you read of Luke. We're told here in this text that in Colossians that he's a physician. He's a medical doctor. He is Paul's personal physician who travels with him on his missionary journeys and travels with him in his church planning and evangelistic work. He's traveling with him. Luke, the physician. So look at these three truths. First, he is indispensable, I would say. He's needful. He's necessary. Paul can't do without him. He is vital to the ministry of the Apostle Paul. And so uh, you say, well, what's, what's that all about? Why is he with Paul? I'll tell you why. Because Paul has health problems. <laughs> he needs a physician. He has health problems. Turn to 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 11. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 23. Listen, listen to the Apostle Paul <clears throat> testifying. Here's what he says. He says, uh, uh, verse 23 of the 11th, it says, and did I say 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians? 2 Corinthians, yes. And are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more, in labors more abundant, in stripes above. He was beaten, wasn't he? Above measures. In prison more frequent. And death often. He was a death door often. Of the Jews five times received I 40 stripes. Save one that is. They couldn't go over the 39 mark. So 39 stripes. Five different times the Jews beat him. 39 stripes across his back. And thrice was I beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. <laughs> they tried to stone him to death. Didn't they? Yeah. Thrice I suffered shipwreck, three times shipwrecks. A night and a day have I been in the deep. He said, a day and a whole 24 hour period, he said, I was out on the water, I don't, just trying to stay afloat because of a shipwreck. Paul! What a preacher. In journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, beside those things that, that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. And he gives all of that list of things, and then he goes into the 12th chapter and says that he has a thorn in the flesh and he's prayed about it three times and the Lord said, nope, you're just going to continue to have it. Yeah. Paul had health problems. A thorn in the flesh, in the flesh. Galatians chapter 4 verse 15 suggests to us that it may have very well been eyesight. He had some vision problems. You do know he was blinded when he got saved. Wasn't he? And the Lord, I don't know. 
Exactly. He may not have retained it or regained it. Um, he he may, may, may have uh, had, had that kind of... The thorn in the flesh, it may not have been his eyesight, but he did say to the Galatians, he said, you would have taken your eyes out for me. Galatians 4, 15. And given them to me. That suggests he had eye problems. Eye problems. And so, at the close of uh, 2 Corinthians and the 13th chapter, see if it's in your Bible. At the close of it, at the very bottom, there's a postscript. And here's what, how it reads. If you've got it in your Bible. It's not one of the verses, but it's just a p added piece, paragraph piece underneath. And it's a postscript. It says, the second epistle to the Corinthians, was, which was written from Philippi, a city of Macedonia, by Titus and Lucas. And Lucas is Luke. So it is suggested that Paul, uh, Luke is medical doctor, physician for Paul, but he is also there because Paul may not be able to write. He can write, he's, he's brilliant, but his eyesight might be of such nature that he's having somebody else write these 13 chapters of 2 Corinthians. Having others, Titus and Luke, ha have them pin it all down. Have them write it down. Instead of him just... So, in 2 Corinthians 12, Paul is promised grace for his thorn in the flesh, isn't he? May I suggest tonight that part of that grace that's given to him is... Luke. <laughs> God gives him Luke. And he's going to be part of the grace, good grace of God on the life of Paul to help him to continue in ministry and to be more effective in ministry. Paul, his whole idea in 2 Corinthians 12 is that this thorn in the flesh has got to go. It's a pain. It's a headache. It's hindering me from being all that I need to be. And that was his idea. And God said, no, not so. It's going to help you to lean on me, look to me, be in humility rather than walking in pride. And so God gives him help. Not by taking away his problem, his malady, but by giving him Luke. He's partner in ministry for him. I, l let me give you a, a truth or two here about physical healing. Uh, Paul the apostle, he has the gift of healing. Right? We can read through the book of Acts that he is doing miraculous stuff. I mean miraculous stuff by the hand of the apostle Paul. And yet Paul needs a medical doctor. Paul can't heal himself. What's that teach me? Well, it first teaches me that it's not always God's will to heal every person in every situation. Paul didn't get healed. 2 Timothy 4.20 is a great passage. Paul's writing and he said, Trophimus, have I left at Miletum sick? Well, how dare you, Paul, if you've got the gift of healing? How come you don't touch him and transform him and give him health before you leave him back there? You know why? Because it's not always the will of God for God to heal a person. We're going to get healed, but it's primarily, well, I mean, we, we got healed because we're here tonight. You've been sick enough that you shouldn't have made it at some point in time. But here we are. And the Lord healed you. The Lord fixed you so that you can continue to function. But one of these days, we are going to get it fully healed whenever we get to heaven. It's 
It's not always the will of God for every person in every situation to be healed. A second thought is this. There is a diminishing of, I'm just sort of side, I'm running rabbits here, okay? There, there's a diminishing of side gifts, diminishing of the sign gifts. What I say? Side gifts? Sign gifts as we come to the completing of the New Testament. The sign gifts, the Jews required a sign, and I don't blame them. And the reason they did was because they, are, they have been given revelation from God about how it's supposed to be done. And the way it's supposed to be done is animal sacrifices at the temple. And temple form with priests and priesthood. And that's a revelation of God to them. Right? And now all of a sudden somebody's come along and said, Oh no, we're doing away with animal sacrifices. It's over. We're doing away with the priesthood. It's over. We're not going to have special class Levi, Levi, Levi people, priests. Everybody that's saved is going to become a priest. <laughs> the priesthood of the believer. Yeah. And so everything's changing. That's what the book of Hebrews is all about. It's about, there's this transition. Listen, you're not, you can't expect the Jew that's been taught Old Testament truth and revelation to the nation of Israel to just accept, oh, well, no, that's not the way it's going to happen anymore. After it's gone this way for 4,000 years. And so God gives signs and one of those signs is the authority has gone from Old Testament priest to New Testament apostles right and New Testament church and so there are these signs God does miracles through Simon Peter, through the Apostle Paul, through the other apostles. He's doing miracles. He's doing miracles. People are getting healed. People are getting raised from the dead. People, and all of that kind of stuff's going on. But let me tell you, the further along we get and the apostles go off the scene and a New Testament revelation is completed, the sign gifts diminish. You say, well, could God raise the dead? Oh, of course he could raise the dead. Today. Well, could God heal somebody? He certainly could heal somebody today. You say, should you take James' passage where it said, anoint him with oil and pray over him and all that kind of business if somebody's sick? Certainly so. But we need to know that this modern movement that says it's always the will of God for somebody to get healed and said if you've not gotten healed it's because you've got sin in your life or you don't have enough faith. That's a lie. It's a lie. I had a fellow argue with me. I, I went through all of this. And I've told you about it before. But I, I just came back with a point to, to the guy. I said, do you understand what you're telling me is that no one should ever get sick and die? And yet the Bible said all of us are going to? <laughs> you're wrong. We were, some of us in this building were involved in demon deliverance ministry stuff early on in our Christian lives. And we've seen all kind of craziness and nonsense and whew, demons manifested in people, coming out of people, wild stuff. And we were told that no matter what your physical malady was, illness, sickness was, it was demonic. And 
and some were told that they need to quit taking their medicine. And then when they got worse because they didn't take their medicine, it was their fault because they didn't have enough faith. Or they still had sin in their lives. Wonder somebody didn't get killed and die over the whole thing. It was wrong. So don't swallow this modern movement that says it's always the will of God to heal everybody in every circumstance and situation. It's not. Paul leaves someone behind sick. Paul himself has some kind of difficulty in his own life that he has to deal with. L let me give you the, the, the sign passage is 1 Corinthians 1, 22, but listen to this Hebrews 2 passage. Uh, For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense and reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, which would be the disciples and the apostles, right? Yeah. Then it goes on and says, God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and with divers or various miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. What's it saying? It's saying that it was all about verifying what they were telling. This new message was truth. This different message is truth. Well, how do you know it? Because there's all of the evidences of these miraculous things happening. But as our New Testament comes, those sign gifts diminished. Are you good? So, it's not a lack of faith if you need a medical profession, professional. Okay? Paul needed one. His name was Luke. He needed for him to travel with him. Poor pitiful Paul didn't have enough faith, I guess. Huh? Are you getting it? All right. He is indispensable. Luke, necessary. He's needed. Very important. Secondly, he is invisible. Luke is only mentioned by name three times in Scripture, and yet he wrote all of the Scripture. He's, he's involved in penning all of the Scripture. And you read about it, Luke chapter 1, if you read there, you, oh, Theophilus and so on, and then and Acts chapter number 1, you have those first few verses, and oh, do, do you understand in the book of Acts, 28 chapters, and it's not until the 16th chapter and the 10th verse, 16th chapter and the 10th verse, finally, Luke, who is with the apostle Paul and Silas, he uses the term we and us. A narrator statement. And he doesn't even mention his name. I don't know about you. If I were traveling with the Apostle Paul, getting honest tonight, if I were traveling with the Apostle Paul, I would at least want to put my name in there and say, hey, Kenny Sanders with the Apostle Paul, helping him out on the first missionary journey and second missionary journey. And I would, you hear me? I would at least want them to know, man, I've been involved. In, listen, look at this. Go ahead and shut me off if you want. <coughs> but Luke doesn't do that. <laughs> Paul 
mentions him. Luke never mentions himself in Luke or in the book of Acts. 28 chapters, 24 chapters, put that together. Help me somebody. Quick. Come on. Mathematical mind. 52. 52 chapters and he doesn't even write about himself. And then, then he said, us and we. He is, as it were, invisible. Travels with Paul for 15 plus years. Doesn't mention himself. He leaves himself out. I would suggest he knows the truth of John 3.30. John the Baptist said, speaking of Jesus, he must increase. And I must decrease. Luke's not about being seen. Not about getting recognition. He's about serving. Even privately. He recognizes life is not about Luke. Life is about Christ. We looked at it last week. For me to live, Paul said, is Christ. That's Luke's same confession. It's not about me. We, happy day whenever I recognize that it's not about me. When you recognize, when we recognize it's not about us. It's about the Lord. He must increase. See, Jesus, is, Jesus must be increased. His truth. Truth about who he is and what he is and what he's done and what he's promised that he'll do. He must increase as Lord in my life. Right? And I must decrease. It's not about me. John the Baptist's message was, Luke's message would be the same. Behold the Lamb of God. Everybody look at Him. Behold Him. Look, look at the one who died at Calvary's cross for us. The Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Look at the great forgiver and Savior. Vance Habner said, God grant us that old country preacher from North Carolina. He said, God grant us the beatitude of the background that only he may be seen. Another said, if anyone would like to acquire humility, I can, I think, tell him the first step. The first step is to realize that one is proud. <laughs> first step to humility? Well, first recognizing that we've got this self-promotion problem about us. It's all about me. And we, so the first step to get past that is to recognize that it's not all about me. It's not supposed to be all about me. And that I've got a problem that needs to be dealt with so that it might be all about him. Look to Philemon 24. Just before the book of Hebrews, Philemon 24. And then also 2 Timothy 4.11. Here are the other two places where Luke's name is mentioned. Philemon 24. Paul, Paul uh, there, salute the Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. And so he mentions Luke. And Philemon. Then just back a page or so. And 2 Timothy 4, 11. 
It said, Demoth has forsaken me, and others have departed, gone here, there, somewhere else. Only, verse 11, only who? Luke is with me. Only Luke is with me. He stayed with Paul. He's, what I would say, immovable. He is indispensable. He's invisible. He's immovable. He stays with Paul. Unlike Demas, who forsook him, he stays 15 plus years. Stayed. If you do remember now, that, that, you, that's no small statement tonight. You do remember that Paul is a trouble magnet. <laughs> right? Everywhere Paul goes, he draws trouble. <laughs> it's, a, it's a wonderful read. And the whole time you're reading your, the book of Acts and all, you're just reading you're just saying, man, I thank God it was Paul. And not me. He's he just one thing after another. But now think about this. <clears throat> Luke is with him. Luke 16. You, you want jailhouse ministry? <laughs> Paul will get you there. Luke. You want shipwreck Acts 27? Ship breaks apart. You got to somehow grab a piece of the ship, the wood of the ship to be able to float to shore. Hope you can get there. When you get there, you'll probably get bit by a poisonous viper. This is tough terrain. Luke is with him. The doctor stuck with him. Stayed by him. But you can know this. If you'll live godly, trouble will come your way too. You say, well, I've never been in jail for preaching the gospel. No, thank God for it. It may come at some point in time because there is an anti-Christian mood Globally. But you can count on it. Yea, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. I don't know why we're su surprised whenever knowingly or unknowingly there, Satan on, on people's parts or whatever. Satan will always try to throw some kind of wrench. S Satan will always try to throw something to discourage you. you you're just trying to do right, and what, what? How come this has happened? Right? It, it an opposition or smart aleck, something this, that, or the other. You know what I'm talking about? <clears throat> opposition yeah. comes when you're just trying to live for God. <clears throat> the devil hates you. You have to make up your mind that it is worth the trouble. He's, he is worth the trouble. He went through the worst of trouble for you. Certainly, he's worthy of us taking whatever trouble comes our way. I can think of those who started down the path I can think of six or seven preachers who started down the path when I started down the path.
and only one of them continues to this date. The rest of them decided making more money was important. I've got a business mind and I can get Maybe they weren't ever called. I don't know. And, and I'm just talking about those young preachers. And I'm not, certainly not bragging on me. I'm just saying that there are many who will not stick. But Luke did. Luke stuck. As just the traveling physician. For, I, I don't even know he's a preacher. Is he a, is he a preacher? He's a penman for New Testament scripture. He's a physician for Paul. And certainly he's telling the gospel. But that doesn't mean he exactly had a call to preach on his life. I wonder, our opening question, will you be a Luke? I can't be a Paul. You know what I mean? Man, Paul. <laughs> Ken, I can't even understand Romans 9. <laughs> Paul. Rich revelation from God. God's special servant for New Testament era. But I do feel like I could be a Luke. Maybe sort of in the background, just trying to help in the gospel. No great, 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 big giftings. But yes, yet can be blessed of God, used of God in His service. Will you be a Luke tonight? Stand. Thank God for all who want to help in gospel ministry. Give money for the work of the ministry in the local church. Give money through the to missionaries who are furthering the gospel in different parts of the world. Thank God for those who are preaching and testifying. Sunday school teachers who want to instill the gospel in hearts the truth of God's word Will you be a Luke?
saved by the grace of God and wanting to serve God. If you've got that, you ought to thank the Lord tonight. There's a whole world that doesn't have it. But thank God for those who do. Brother Daniel, dismiss us, please.